18 is where we will be in God's Word this evening. The first verse is where we begin reading. We will read down to the fifth verse, Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus is still in the midst of this sermon that we've been studying, still in the midst of this discourse. When Luke informs us that there was another interaction that he had with the crowd, some are present at that very time, verse 1 says, who announced something to Jesus. They told him something. Are you aware of the Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices? They are telling Jesus about a particular atrocity, a particular tragedy. And now we find that Jesus is willing to comment on that and apply a lesson that he wants to apply from that which they've announced to him. He lived in a world in which there was tragedy and atrocity. We live in a world in which there is tragedy and many atrocities. When man sinned, ushered into this world, was the presence of death. God's judgment upon this world was a curse. And the result of that is we live in a world that's full of misery. Some of the misery is due to the fact that we do live in a world that physically is under a curse. There is disease, there is deformity, there is death. But because the death that man fell into is not just physical, because there's spiritual death, we also live in a world full of the misery that is directly explained by man's evil. We live in a world where there are murders, all sorts of injustice, all sorts of expressions of evil. And as humanity tries to make sense of this world, I mean if you exclude God and you exclude the gospel and you exclude the truth of the scriptures, then how are you to make sense of it all? And as the world of humanity tries to make sense of the misery that we live in the midst of, some people view all of this as just, you know, a bunch of accidents. Some things happen that are just accidents. For example, a, a tower falling on 18 people and killing them. Some people would just say, well, that's just an accident. And when it comes to those acts of evil men that everyone knows not to be accidental but purposeful, then we sit around and we discuss how to make sense of that. How could someone do such a thing? How do we explain this? Have you ever noticed when someone commits some atrocity in our world that the evening talk shows and the news programs, they, they all devote themselves to discussing how to make sense of it. And after all the conversation, no one has made sense of it. How could someone who is so intelligent do such a thing? He was making such good grades. How could he commit this particular act of evil. How could this happen? And then through it all, there's this sort of discussion. Wouldn't it be great if we had direct access to God so he could explain it all to us? Where is God in all of this? Is there a God? And if there is a God, where was he? You ever heard that kind of conversation? Where was he? Where was God? when this happened. 
And so men act as if God has nothing to say about human tragedy. We act as if God has nothing to say about these atrocities. As if he hasn't given us any revelation that is sufficient to address our questions. We act as if God is absent. If there is a God, we act as if he is absent. We act as if he is silent. We can ask all the questions we want to ask, but we think to ourselves, or men think to themselves, God never answers. Well, what we find in our verses here is that there was a day when men asked God, because who is Jesus? God in human flesh. We read of a day when men asked God face to face about a particular tragedy, an atrocity. And we find that God was not silent. We find that God offered commentary on it. God offered a perspective of it. God offered answers related to it. We, we ought to say to this world of ours, God is not silent when it comes to this sort of thing. But here's the question, are you willing to hear his answer? Jesus was not silent, but are we willing to hear his answer? Because his answer is somewhat shocking. In fact, I think if we gave the answer Today, in many cases, the answer that Jesus gave, we would certainly be branded insensitive. I mean, in view of what's just happened, how could you say what Jesus says on this occasion? It's not insensitive, though. It's just the opposite. What Jesus does here is divine love. He offers a warning. In view of human tragedy and atrocities, God offers mankind a warning. So tonight I want to point out from Christ's answer to a question from a crowd, I want to to point out five divine responses to man's questions about tragedy in the world. Five divine responses to man's questions about tragedy or atrocities in the world. Look again at verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him, announced to him, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Let's just stop there for a moment. This apparently was something that had happened recently because they don't just assume that Jesus knew about it. They're informing him. They're telling him about it. They're announcing it to him. Lord, did you know about this? And what they describe is a situation where some Galileans had made their way to the temple to offer sacrifices. So apparently this happened at Passover. Pilgrims made their way into the city of Jerusalem. They go to the temple. They're offering their sacrifices. And Pilate took it as an opportunity to make a statement. He may have viewed these people as being in association with some who were against the Roman government. We don't know all the background to this. In fact, this is not recorded anywhere else except right here in Scripture. Nothing in history, nothing from Josephus, nothing like that that tells us about this incident. So this is what we have, God's revelation, the history as it's recorded in God's inerrant word. This is what we have. What we do know is these people who had gone to offer sacrifices were executed so that their blood was mingled with their sacrifices. We know that Pilate was a cruel man. We know that he was a wicked man, and so... We get some insight into his character by this account. So they're announcing this. Why are they telling Jesus about this? Well, they want his response. What do you say about this, Jesus? What is your response to this? And the first thing I want to point out is he answered them, verse 2, and he answered them. So first, I just want to simply establish the point that God is willing to respond to our questions about these sorts of things. As I said earlier, men sometimes act as if heaven is silent, as if God has left us hopeless without any answers. When faced with this world that we live in, a world that's full of misery and sin, well, Jesus was not silent. 
He didn't ignore the question. He could have. You have this crowd of people all trampling upon one another. I'm sure there were many things shouted out to him, asked of him. He could have just moved on, but he didn't do that. He addresses this question. He answers this question. He was willing to answer. God does have a word for human tragedy. God does have a word for these sorts of events. In fact, he's not only willing to answer this particular question, notice he is so willing to engage the issue, he raises another incident. He's the one who says in verse 4, well, let's begin with verse 3 to put it in context, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then he says, or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell. And we're not entirely certain about this tower. Most think that it was inside the wall of Jerusalem, southeast corner. Perhaps when they were constructing it, there was an accident. It fell, and 18 people died. Jesus says, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? So Jesus not only responds to this particular incident that they raise, he, he raises another issue. So he is more than willing to engage this, this sort of question. And I just want to say to you that if, if you have questions like these, if you wonder about things that happen in this world, things that hurt you and disappoint you and somewhat even disillusion you, I mean, don't be afraid to go to God with your questions, but be ready to open the Word of God and to receive His answers. He has spoken. He has given us revelation that is sufficient to deal with these sorts of things. Second thing I want you to notice, notice not only a divine word on human tragedy, but second, notice a divine word on human assumptions. Before we can receive the answer of Jesus, there's something that Jesus knows we must do. There's something that he, he does. If we're going to hear his answer, then we have to turn down the sound on our own way of thinking. Oftentimes we do not really hear the answer of God because our way of thinking drowns out what he's saying to us. We can't hear what God is saying because we're hearing his answer through the grid of our presuppositions, our assumptions. And so right away Jesus has to address some assumptions that he knows they are carrying around in their minds and in their hearts. He knows this is true of humanity in general. He's addressing a crowd of people. And he's able to speak to an assumption that he knows is present in humanity, especially the Jews at this time. He says, verse 2, do you think, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? You know, people talk, why did this happen to them? Why do you think... You know, we went to, to take our sacrifices and nothing happened to us. And these people from Galilee took their sacrifices and they ended up dead. Why do you think this happened to them? Or those 18 people, the tower fell on them. I wonder what, what happened, why this happened. Why are they the ones who've been affected? Verse 4, those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think, Jesus says, do you suppose that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? What assumption is Jesus wanting to clear away? You know, the rubble of wrong thinking. What assumption is he wanting to clear away by these statements? It is the assumption that events in this world form a commentary on individual righteousness. It is the assumption that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. Were these people worse sinners? Did the Galileans suffer this way because of some sin in their life? Did the 18 people have a tower fall on them because there was something wrong in their life? And folks, I wonder if we're willing to be honest about how deeply embedded this wrong way of thinking really is in us. Because it's not just unbelievers who think this way. In fact, I'm going to tell you tonight, it's not just somebody else who thinks this way. You think this way. You let you go through something very difficult, very hard, that doesn't just go away quickly, it doesn't dissipate easily, and you are stressed, and it doesn't stop. And what thought begins to enter into your mind? 
I wonder what I'm doing wrong. What am I doing wrong? Now that, that can be a reasonable question. We should examine ourselves. But, but what is the assumption? If I were doing right, things would be easier, wouldn't they? And so if things are difficult, if someone I love has died, if the tree fell on my house, if, you know, fill in the blank. I mean, what have I done wrong? And what does Jesus say? He says, verse 3, no. No, I tell you something else. He says in verse 5, no. I mean, he's, he's making this emphatic. You have it wrong. This assumption of yours is wrong. What happens in this world is not a commentary on individual righteousness. There are, are very godly people who are very much right with the Lord, saved, covered by the blood of Jesus, walking with Christ faithfully, who have tragic things happen in their lives. Tragic things. And Psalm 73 is just one example of a testimony to the fact that you have people who are very wicked, who from this temporal point of view seem to be doing very well. So that's a wrong assumption. But let me just say this, and you know this. This is not the only kind of wrong assumption that we carry around in our thinking when it comes to atrocities and tragedies. Let me give you some others that we witness in our culture. One assumption that many people carry around in their mind is the assumption that most men are good, and so all worldly troubles are unjust. See, that's, that's where that question comes from. Where was God? Where was God when this happened? How could a loving God allow this to happen in the lives of these people? Now, what's at work? What's under the surface at work in that sort of attitude? These people had done nothing wrong. These are good people. These are fine people. These are people who deserve better than this. God, humanity deserves better than this. And so the assumption is that men are basically good, and therefore all worldly troubles are undeserved. We don't deserve trouble. Or the assumption that God is uninvolved in what is happening in the world. You know, don't blame God. This wasn't God's fault. God couldn't have done anything about that. I mean, that also is an attitude that some people carry around in their mind. I think I've told you this before, but years ago now, over 15 years ago, when I was serving in Elgin, in the middle of the morning, 2, 3 in the morning, I got a call, and a dear friend and one of the members of our church, he was weeping on the other end of the phone, and he, and he told me, Brother Richard, Stewie, Stewie is dead. And this was his son, the, the man had been divorced and remarried. This was his son visiting his ex-wife, his mother. She, he, was, he was with his mother in Arizona. And they were coming home from a trip, and they were near the house. And someone ran a stop sign and plowed into the car, and his son was killed. And she, the mother, uh, had her pastor officiate at the funeral service. And this man asked me to go to Arizona and, uh, and officiate as well. And so we shared in the funeral service. And, the, and I followed her pastor, and the man got up and he said, and I won't, I won't get the words exactly right, it was a long time ago, but this was definitely the message, God had nothing to do with this. God had nothing to do, God, in other words, God was nowhere around when this happened, so to speak. He, if he could have stopped it, he would have stopped it. If he could have done something, he would have done something. And so in the minds of many people, when you talk about tragedies and atrocities, the idea is God is hands off. He's powerless. He's as helpless as we are. And I had to tell the crowd that day that what that man had said was wrong. What a hopeless situation it would be if we served a God who isn't sovereign, Amen. who isn't sovereign over every detail of life. Does that mean that God in the realm of his desires is pleased with everything that happens in this world? Of course not. Of course not. But there isn't one stray atom in this universe. There's nothing running around independent of God's will in the sense of his decrees. Nothing. 
And that means we can say with people like Joseph. This is how someone like Joseph could not be so could not be bitter at his brothers for what they did. He understood you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I'm where God wants me to be. So some people assume that God's just uninvolved, hands off, got the universe running, stepped away from it. It's all just running on its own. Some people assume, of course, and this is very sad, that there is no God. And therefore there is no meaning to what happens in this world. It's all just a bunch of events happening in a world that got started out of some sort of you know, big bang and, and here, here it all is and no creator and no meaning to life. Well, Jesus addresses the assumption that was in the minds of those people he was talking to and he says, do you think they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Do you think that these people upon whom this tower fell, do you think they were worse offenders than all the other? This happened because of their sin? And their sin somehow was worse than yours? Outweighed yours? That's why the tower fell on them and not on you? So we have a divine word on human tragedy. God is willing to engage us on this. And we have a divine word on human assumptions. If we're going to hear his answer, we have to clear away the rubble in our thinking. We have to get rid of the wrong assumptions. Third, I want to point out, we have here a divine word on personal application. Because what does Jesus do with their question? He doesn't talk about this in benign terms, terms so general that there's no connection to the lives of the people whom he's addressing. He says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. And then what does he say? I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 5, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Christ makes plain, not only is there meaning to what is happening in this world, God means for us to get the message and apply it to ourselves. We are meant to think in personal terms when tragic events take place in this world. We are to reflect on those things from a spiritual point of view, from a divine point of view, and we had better make an application to our own lives. Do you do that? When you hear of awful things happening in our world, do you think about those things from the standpoint of Scripture? And do you make the application that you should make to your own life? God is not only concerned with what's happening in this world, he's concerned enough to give us the truth that impacts every single one of us. But we have to apply it. We have to apply it. Fourth, we have here a divine word on human guilt. Now this is where the message becomes politically incorrect rapidly. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? If you just stop there, you could be encouraged. This isn't about sin, personal sin, right? Oh, it's not because they were sinners. I mean, you could, you could come away with that impression if that's how you heard him. But that's not what he said. He said, do you think they were worse sinners than the ones who are still living? Verse 5, do you think they were worse, or verse 4 rather, do you think they were worse offenders, worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? What's his answer? No. No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish in the same way. Like this, you know, there's, there's a, a similarity here. When, when these sudden, shocking, shaking tragedies that remind us all of our mortality 
happen in this world. It is a message to the whole human race that the whole human race is headed for disaster. That's the message. It's the message of universal guilt. It's the message of the fact that this whole world of humanity is sinful. And in fact, if you say, well, how sinful are we all? This sinful. That unless there is repentance, what happens to all of us? If there's no repentance, I'm going to talk about repentance in just a moment. If there's no repentance, we're born into the world, right? Take my own case, 1963, August 31st, there I am born to my mom and dad. Now, I begin to live my life, and I live my life, maybe I live my life morally. Maybe I live my life religiously. Maybe I live my life in such a way there's no glaring blight, stain on my reputation. But if I live my life without repentance, without repentance, we're going to ask what that is in just a moment. If I live my life without repentance, what's my end? According to Jesus. I what? I perish. I perish. The word, the Greek word there has to do with destruction. I will be destroyed. And if you take this statement in the context of everything else Jesus says and everything the Bible says about this, what you will learn and understand, it's not a temporal destruction. It's an everlasting destruction. That is who we are. Our guilt before God is such that unless there is repentance, we all die. We all perish. We are all destroyed. We are all judged. Isn't that what Jesus has just talked about in the previous section we just finished this morning? When he said to us, you know, you know how to read the signs of the heavens and the sky and all the rest, but you don't know what time you're living in right now. You don't understand that the Messiah is standing right in front of you you need to recognize this, and why don't you, he says in verse 57, why don't you make a right judgment here? Why don't you settle accounts with the judge before you have to face him? There's a way for you to be forgiven. There's a way for your debts to be settled. You see, you have this debt before God. You stand guilty before God, and God is willing to settle the debts and to forgive you of your sins, but you have this opportunity that's right now, and you'd better do it before you face the judge. And here Jesus says, if you don't repent, here's where you're all headed, right before that judge, and the result of it is going to be you perish. What does that mean? It means the whole world stands guilty before God. The whole world. The whole world. Every one of you, if you have not repented, you are headed for destruction. And everyone you know and love, if they have not repented, they are headed for destruction. That's the message of Jesus in the face of the report of tragedy. This is, this is what God is doing graciously, lovingly with this world. He's shaking it from time to time and saying, do you understand where you're headed? Jesus said in John 3, 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is, what? Condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. If you've not believed in Jesus, what is God's verdict concerning you? You are condemned. You are judged. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The wrath of God remains on him. What, where's the wrath of God at right now as it relates to unbelieving human beings? It is on the human race. And all that awaits is the execution So Jesus says that apart from repentance, this is a divine word on human guilt in the face of tragedy. This is God's message to the world. If you don't repent, you will perish in much the same way. Sudden, unexpected, shakes, not able to be reversed, finished, done. Which gets to the fifth thing and the last thing tonight. Notice that Jesus on this occasion answers this question with a divine word on the way of deliverance. 
This is God's grace. This is God's love. This is God's mercy that he announces. He always announces the way to be delivered. He doesn't just pronounce judgment. He says, now here's how to be forgiven. Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, there is a way out. There is a way out. There is a way not to perish. Verse 5, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There is a way not to perish. What is the way? Repentance. Repent and you won't perish. Repent and you won't perish. Repent and you won't perish. What is repentance? This is the message that is rarely being heard, unfortunately, in our day and age. We talk a lot about salvation. We don't talk much about repentance. What is repentance? It is fundamentally a change of mind. It's a change in the way you think. It is a revolutionary transformation in your perspective. It is a change of mind that leads to, we're going to see this in a moment, it leads to a change of life, a change of course. It's not just intellectual, it is volitional. And it is the result of God doing something in a person's heart so that they are remorseful, they are sorrowful about the wrong path that they've been on. So here I am, I've been on the wrong path, thinking the wrong way, looking at life from the wrong vantage point. Repentance is when now I am awakened, I can see, I have light, I'm on the wrong path, and I'm sorry over what I have done against God. I am sorrowful in a godly manner, in a Godward manner. So that now I'm willing to turn from this pathway that I've been on to embrace the living God and his son and his way to save me. And I will follow him now, you see. I go from hating God to loving God. I go from hating Christ to loving Christ. I go from a self-centered, self-reliant life to a God-centered, Christ-centered, Christ-reliant life. I'm no longer going to trust in my merits to save me. I recognize I have none. Talk about a fundamental shift in your thinking. I'm a sinner. I can't do one thing to save myself. There's nothing good in me. I'm the chief of sinners. I deserve the wrath of God. God enlightens me to see this and understand this so that now I run to Christ to embrace him and all of his perfections and what he has done to save sinners like me. I'm like the publican who beats his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. The Pharisee is not repenting. He, his mind has not been changed. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I don't do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this. Let me give you my laundry list of all my good things, and I thank you I'm not like that man, and this man is crying out to God for mercy. And Jesus says that man goes home justified. The man who has called out to God for mercy, the man who has looked to God for salvation, Look to the finished payment that's been offered for him, propitiated toward God. This is repentance, a change of mind, a revolutionary, radical change in my thinking that results in a change of heart, a change of will, a change of life. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 says, For even, Paul writing to a church, he was thankful that they had repented. And he says this, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. Let me just alert you to something. You can be sorry over what you've done in a worldly way. You can be sorry for who you are and what you've done in a way that will actually lead you to death, lead you to hell. Can you think of anyone in the Bible who was sorry for what he had done but he wasn't saved? 
Who comes to mind first and foremost? Judas. What, what does his grief lead him to do? He goes out and he hangs himself. He commits suicide. Godly grief doesn't lead to death. Godly grief leads to Christ. Godly grief leads us to God's remedy for our sins. So I'm sorry for who I am. God has enlightened me. I see my sin. I'm sorry for who I am. I'm sorry for what I've done. But it's leading to salvation because it leads me to God's remedy for my sins. It leads me to Christ. He goes on to write, For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in the matter. It wasn't just a th change of thinking and attitude. It, it changed the way they were living. It changed the way they were living. Repentance is forsaking a way to pursue a new way. And it is always a faith commitment. Repentance is just the flip side of the coin of faith. It is penitent faith. It is believing God about me and believing God about him. It is believing God about where I've been and believing God about where I need to be. It is a faith commitment from sin to God's remedy for my sin, Christ. And that's what Jesus has in mind here. He has initial repentance in mind. He has the repentance in mind that, that is found where there is justification, where there is initial and complete forgiveness of sins in, in faith in Christ. Because notice the, the opposite of this repentance will be perishing. Either I repent or I perish. And so the repentance is the repentance that's found in salvation, that looks to Jesus he doesn't say here what the repentance means, but if you expand out beyond just these five verses and you listen to the entire sermon and you take note of the entire gospel of Luke, it becomes plain. Repentance means looking to Jesus. It means believing in Jesus. It means trusting in him, believing him. This is what he's just been exhorting them to do. He's just talked about this division that he brings on earth that will divide people even down into their homes based upon their faith in him. So to repent is to turn to Christ. And folks, I want you to know, and you know this, I'm preaching to the large choir tonight for the most part. But I want you to understand this is a miracle. This is nothing less than a supernatural work of grace in the heart. Do you know that repentance is a gift? Do you know that you can't even repent on your own? It is God who grants this sight that we're talking about tonight. It is God who shines his light into a heart to show a person who they really are and what their sins really are. It is God who makes a person sorry for who they are and sorry for what they've done in a Godward way. It is God who reveals his perfect and beautiful son to a sinner so that now they desire the son of God and would run to the son of God. It is God who makes one dissatisfied with life as he has known it and a hunger for Jesus and for forgiveness with God with all of his heart. It is God who works this in a person's life. It's the result of new birth. Where there is new birth, there will be repentance. There will be repentance. It is the transformation of a person so that now the desire for God and for truth and for obedience is an internal motivation. Have you repented? Has the Lord saved you? Do you find now an internal motivation to serve the living God? Do you find that you love Christ? You desire Him to please Him, to follow Him? Is this in your heart? Or do you just have a form of godliness? where the pressure is always external. It's from someone else, or it's from a guilty conscience, instead of a positive desire that flows out of the new heart that God creates in the believing sinner. By the way, when this repentance happens, it's permanent. So what do you mean? I mean, you go on in faith, and here's what that means, you go on repenting. Anybody here still repenting? You go on repenting. This is sanctification. You go on repenting. Day by day, issue by issue, 
where there is sin, we choose Christ. We choose Christ. And where we don't choose him, we're disciplined for it, and we come to see our wrongs, and the Lord enlightens us, and what do we do? We repent, and we choose Christ. And so they come to God in human flesh. And they say, is there any way to make sense of a tragedy like this? This sort of atrocity? He says, yeah, there's a message in this. The stuff that shakes you, shocks you. Understand the sudden kind of disaster? That's where the whole world is headed. And unless you repent, that's what's going to happen to you. Final thought, how do you know if you've repented? Unless you repent, you perish. How do you know if you've repented? Isn't it interesting that Jesus gives a parable right at that moment? Next verse, and he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. And this this guy's put a lot of work into this, this tree. He doesn't want to see it cut down right now. It deserves to be cut down. The man who had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, he has every right to expect that it would bear fruit. It hasn't for three years. He's not wrong to say, we're going to cut it down and put something there that's going to make good use of the ground. Right? Verse 7, why should it use up the ground? But this vine dresser that's put in so much work, he asks for just a little more time. Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This parable really means to communicate one main truth. What is it? Where there is real repentance, there will be fruit. There will be fruit. When do the fruitless deserve to be cut down? Now. So what does it mean when the fruitless are not already cut down? It means mercy. It means space. It means time. It means opportunity. Opportunity for what? For repentance. Because it's only through the saving work of God that you will ever bear fruit. How do you know if you've repented? Well, what does the fruit say? Is there fruit that says Christ is really in you? The Holy Spirit really dwells in you. The fruit of righteousness, obedience, love for God. Is it there? And if not, why are you not already cut down? Because you see, there's mercy and there's an opportunity to turn from your sins and embrace God's Son. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your son. Thank you for our Savior. Thank you for the fact that you took on our questions about these things that are miserable and the result of the fall these tragedies and atrocities, we we seek to make sense of them, and Lord, you have given us an answer. You haven't answered perhaps every curiosity and everything, Lord, that we would like to know, but you've answered what we need to know, that we must look to you, that we must recognize our mortality and the reality of immortality, and that our need is for forgiveness. Our greatest need is for forgiveness. And so grant in this room, I pray, the wisdom to settle accounts while there's still time. 
to turn from sin and to embrace your loving Son and to receive the full and free forgiveness that's found in Him. Thank you for the mercy that makes this opportunity a reality, Lord. Thank you that you haven't already cut down the people in this room who have no fruit because they don't have Jesus. Thank you that they are here to hear this tonight. And may you, Lord, impress upon their mind and their heart this night that today is the day to be saved. Today is the day to call out to Christ and to receive him, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Let that be their testimony tonight, that they could say, I have trusted in Christ and have discovered that he died for me. And I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.